I know that this is just yet another AAA gaming video that's just going to be buried under the sea of videos out there that just mischaracterizes the worst aspects of the industry as if it conflates the entire gaming landscape. Fuck! There's nothing else to play! I wanna play something! But we're gonna do something a little different today. Just one year ago, not many people were being hyped about Helldivers 2 and Power World. There was just barely any hype for both games, and you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who did manage to sink their time on the original Helldivers back then. But you never knew just which game would blow up, and sure enough, we're living at a time where some of the most talked about games right now aren't even from the AAA sphere. Why is Helldivers 2 and Power World proving that you don't need a bloated budget or an overemphasis on monetization to make a game fun? Why did both of these games prove that you don't need to be big to be successful? <laughs> Look familiar? Scenes like these are happening all over the galaxy right now. Now, I'll be really honest here. The idea of a Helldivers 2 was something that just wasn't visited by many people at the time. The first game which was released in 2015 was a much smaller scale project back then. Arrowhead designed it as a top down shooter at the time but with the same goal, deliver managed democracy. So even as a top down shooter, I remember playing a good amount of Helldivers back on the PS3 and it was just fun to play. More importantly, you were working with your teammates with a much bigger common goal in mind. Kill every enemy standing in your way to spread democracy. You also had the unique stratagem mechanic where you could call upon support to boost your abilities, or call on an airstrike to get a tactical advantage over your enemies. This thought was bubbling in my mind, with a game like this having a ton of well designed mechanics, and actually getting people to work together in a way that not many multiplayer titles were doing, Arrowhead, they were onto a huge winner. Helldivers received praise for this critically, and I'd, I'd like to think that it was also doing pretty well commercially. It's also worth noting that some of the decisions made for this game would somewhat foreshadow what Sony would be doing today. A PC day and date release for their live service games, and cross-play between platforms. People mostly see PlayStation releasing their games on PC for like the last few years, but they dropped Helldivers on PC near the end of 2015 months after its console release. Whilst the first Helldivers was released at a time when Sony were actively being seen as the most consumer friendly platform holder, they did cross play between three PlayStation consoles at the time, the PS3, the PS4 and the PS Vita, so it was much easier to find a game if you had at least one of those consoles. Sadly though, there's no PC cross play. The overarching intergalactic war it was across both the PC and the PlayStation versions because the progress across both platforms was shared within the servers. Now what happens when you combine some of the best mechanics from Helldivers and transform it into a third person shooter? You get Helldivers 2. Truth be told, when Helldivers 2 was announced, it got a little bit of my interest considering that the first game was good for the most part, but my scepticism about Sony pushing for live service games, it might have clouded my judgement in that aspect, and I didn't even have it on my radar for February's releases, I just played Persona 3 Reload for the whole of that month, I made a video about that game if you want to check it out, but I did not expect Helldivers 2 to blow up this hard, but when you actually play the game, you can see why it deserves the success that it has received. It's just that fun as a PvE shooter. Compared to a lot of other multiplayer games, there's a strong goal that unites the entire community to work together in real time. You've got a planet to protect, your freedom to protect, and most importantly, you got to spread democracy across the lands filled with bugs and robots who will just kill you at every turn. The atmosphere in Helldivers 2, it feels immediately different to other shooters and in a very good way. It feels like you not only have a cause to fight for, but the immediate sense of danger you're getting from the moment you land into enemy territory, it's right there in front of you. That is why the gameplay loop just feels so fun in Helldivers 2 and why it became such a viral game. Every encounter with your teammates and fighting Terminids and Automatons feels unique, and it isn't overwhelming you with bullshit damage numbers and all sorts of arbitrary BS to keep you playing. It's just a fun game and that's what really matters. Helldivers 2 also benefited so much from being a simultaneous PS5 and PC release, and I genuinely think that without the PC community really jumping into this game from the very start, I doubt it would have, it would have been as successful as it has been, if I'm being really honest. Whilst no one would have expected it to blow up as well as it did, 
Helldivers 2 just proved one thing for sure. You just need to make your game fun with an engaging gameplay loop and a consistent content schedule that keeps people interested in your game. And honestly, it's not even egregious enough with its, with its microtransactions either, to the point where the CEO of Arrowhead literally said one of the best takes regarding microtransactions in gaming. You need to earn the right to monetize. This game is literally $40 as well, at a time when AAA companies are trying to push the limits of how much people can pay with the $70 base price and pushing for cosmetics on top of it, Helldivers 2 is just amazing value by comparison. Put it this way, Helldivers 2 absolutely deserves all the success it's gotten. As of right now, the game has already sold 8 million units and it doesn't ever seem to let up in terms, of, in terms of its play account. It's one of the most played games right now on Steam and PlayStation at this point. Now we're going to focus on a different kind of game. What happens when you take advantage of a franchise that's a global icon in gaming and anime, but it's stagnated severely to the point where people want more out of it, and you add guns to it? Pokemon plus guns gives you the equation that is Power World. Like with Helldivers 2 when that got a little bit of coverage last year, it caught my interest but it wasn't something that many people were talking about, but at the start of the year it blew up when it came out. I tried Power World and I'll, I'll be honest, it's not a game that I could really get used to and it was obviously pretty buggy since it's in early access, I couldn't stand the scuffed audio on the Xbox version, but I can see the appeal behind this game, I can see the vision behind it. You wake up in an island inhabited by pals and you have to catch them whilst crafting items and making sure you can survive across the vast area you've been left in. It reminds you of Ark, but it's probably because the gameplay resembles exactly what like Ark does. What really sets it apart is the introduction of the pals. They're just like Pokemon, where you can catch them with pal spheres, raise them, level them up, and help you to scavenge and find materials for you to craft. Well, the last one sounds a bit like slavery, but yeah. It's a janky game, but that's literally fine since it's an early access. And the idea of combining Pokemon with guns is the one thing that no one has ever done up until now. It's no wonder why Power World blew up, and it got pretty close to PUBG's highest concurrent player count on Steam. It's also $30, meaning that you're getting a good survivor experience for a reasonable price, or alternatively, you can get it on Game Pass. Also, we have to consider the experience that the developers, Pocket Pair, went through. The game was projected to cost just under 1 billion yen, the equivalent of 6.5 million dollars. Everything had to be riding on this project, otherwise Pocket Pair wouldn't really be able to exist as a developer. They had no budget limits on developing Power World, they just, they just spent money until the bank balance went down to zero. The developers had no experience with developing animations, or even being able to utilise Unreal Engine to its fullest. It took Pocket Pair CEO exactly a month to create a full 3D model for Power World, whereas the studio's previous game, Craftopia, it was produced with pre-made assets. Considering that most of the stuff were relatively new to game development, the fact that Power World exists the way that it does is an achievement within itself. He mentioned that investing millions onto massive AAA projects wasn't an option for them, but considering how Power does do even with its limitations, I just don't think they'll be considering it any time soon. Not everyone was happy about this though. There were whole threads on Twitter talking about how Power World wasn't an original game and was using AI. I don't want to go too much into detail with it, but people were looking into how similar the PALs were designed in comparison to Pokemon's designs, and not to mention the accusations of Power World using AI. It's fine not to like a game, but trying to reach with some of the most baseless accusations about it is another thing entirely. And it was enough to get the Pokemon company to respond about the situation, but I doubt anything would get far for now. If it's getting controversy of accusations of plagiarism or the alleged use of AI, you know the saying, any publicity is good publicity. It created a Streisand effect leading to more people buying Power World and giving it a try for themselves. And whilst the hype has somewhat fizzled out because most people have experienced everything the game has to offer, it still doesn't take away from the fact that it is one of the biggest releases of this year by far. The biggest kicker here is that these aren't even relatively massive games in terms of their overall budget or scale, they're just fun experiences all around. I think it says a lot when people are looking for games that just bring in the fun factor and are not pushing you to spend more of your money to get that cosmetic or gameplay advantage over other players. 
out of the biggest multiplayer games released so far this year, they all came from AA or indie studios. Some of the best games this year weren't even from the biggest studios out there. It also speaks volumes when some of the live service games from bigger publishers have bombed beyond belief, but I've already talked about this before on my channel. They weren't even fun games to begin with anyway, I mean Skull and Bones alone had Ubisoft boasting about it being a quadruple A game, but they're only saying that because the game isn't fun and they've dropped millions on a project that couldn't even be cancelled because of government grants. What's the lesson to take from games like Helldivers 2, Power World and even Lethal Company releasing to such high acclaim while seeing massive publishers fall flat on their live service and triple your ambitions? The games need to be fun. The games need to keep you and your friends on an engaging gameplay loop that doesn't get old at all. Pushing for hyperrealism is now at a point where the diminishing returns are becoming far too costly and hard to even notice. Like, who's going to notice the extra pause on an NPC's face? And above all, prioritise the needs of your player base rather than trying hard to push for scale and people's wallets. Now, I've made a few videos talking about the unsustainable budgets of AAA gaming and live service games bombing both critically and commercially, so if you want to check these videos out, feel free to click on each of them on screen. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.